Thank you so much, Dr. Resnick, and to uh, all of LEARN for giving me the opportunity to participate in this really fantastic presentation. I wanna thank Dr. Friedman as well for his uh, really great insights. Um, my hope is to take the few minutes that I have to share uh, how we are trying to build a learning health system for rehabilitation at the Cleveland Clinic. I wanted to focus specifically on Dr. Friedman's emphasis on uh, the culture of learning and improvement and infrastructure. Um, these are things that uh, we're trying to develop as part of our learning health system model. And uh, admittedly, after hearing this talk from Dr. Friedman, we'll certainly be reevaluating and looking, looking for opportunities uh, for refinement based on things that we've learned from him. Uh, and then I will share a couple of brief kind of crude examples of the learning cycle uh, that Dr. Friedman uh, described for us, the P to D, D to K, and K to P. So uh, we're fortunate that our entire health system has adopted a culture of improvement, uh, specifically that every caregiver is capable, empowered, and expected to make improvements every day. And so um, because of that, our uh, departments of rehabilitation can really just capitalize on the culture that our organization is trying to engender anyway and permeate the, the entire system. Uh, in addition, we have a, an organizational model for improvement. Um, the details of this model, I don't think are really pertinent to this talk, but the fact that this model exists uh, really allows us to kind of capitalize as a foundation for our own work as we try to develop a learning health system for our work in rehabilitation. Uh, the task then for us um, is mostly to align with that existing culture by creating the infrastructure that Dr. Friedman described. And so uh, th this is a bit of how our effort has looked, um, in including getting the right people. And I really love this figure from Kelly Daly published in Physical Therapy in 2018 that talks about some of the core people that need to be at, at, on this team, uh, specifically health system scientists, uh, folks who uh, maybe PhD trained in uh, research methodology for health services research or other areas of research pertinent to rehabilitation, depending on the question that uh, your learning community is seeking to address, uh, but also experts in quality improvement uh, who are part of our team as well. Uh, clinical operations leaders are certainly vital to this. Um, they need to support uh, a, a shared vision, uh, provide set expectations, and be the leaders in making sure that the culture uh, is shared and permeating throughout the entire group. An informatician, uh, this person uh, really um, needs to have a firm grasp of what the electronic health record looks like um, so that when you're collecting data around what we're currently doing in practice is the way Dr. Friedman described it, that it can be collected in a standardized way and in a way that becomes useful when you need to pull it out and learn from it. Um, so we have an informatician on our team who's actually our, our clinical manager for informatics for rehabilitation. Where we've struggled more uh, with our own infrastructures with this technical leader, um, this person uh, really needs to have a firm grasp of when the data is collected uh, at, at the clinical bedside, what happens then to that data? Um, so, you know, at, at Cleveland Clinic, we have an enterprise data vault where this data kind of disappears. So we've had to partner with some of our business intelligence analysts um, and try to make them uh, become part of our team, uh, depending on the problem we're seeking to address, so that we can really access these data that we need when we need them for the problems we're seeking to address. In addition to having the right people, uh, we are really trying to be conscious of the processes that engender the culture, uh, especially, specifically around participation. So uh, we've created a, what we call our vision board. And this really currently only exists in our, at our acute care hospital uh, main campus with our rehabilitation staff. Um, and with this vision board, our department has uh, now virtual access to submit ideas for improvement. Those ideas could, could range from things like uh, putting a coat rack in the uh, locker room to things like you can see here on this, uh, on the board as it's displayed here, under one of the approved ideas, the impact of occupational therapy in the cardiac ICU, which I would define more as one of those wicked problems uh, that Dr. Friedman described. And so the idea for these ideas for improvement come to uh, what we call our vision board committee, which is actually a peer group of uh, therapists in our department who with the submitters of these ideas to talk about them more and try to understand how this will lead to improvement and their relevance to our work. And but then categorize them. Um, you know, Dr. Friedman showed those varying sizes of circles 
uh, around this cycle. And so this vision board committee helps to facilitate um, the size of those, those circles and make sure that we're doing the right work to address the right problem. Um, and that's what this looks like. You know, we, then we, once an idea has been approved and work begins, we really try to make it a collaborative process with the stakeholders involved. Um, this particular group was looking at an issue that was specific to our department. So here you see a group of physical and occupational therapists tackling one of the problems that we were seeking to fix. In part of that, that process of categorization, uh, we come often to the impact effort matrix uh, to understand you know, how, exactly how much uh, effort will this take and what resources need to be devoted to this work, um, these problems that are being addressed. So um, we've added kind of a, a, an additional category here, uh, which is really more methodologically sound health services research of our truly wicked problems in our systems. Um, to tackle the health of our, our patients and also uh, improve the way that our, our caregivers provide their, their care that they do um, and do it with our work. So the, the, that we feel kind of falls like right at the top far end of this impact effort matrix, recognizing these problems are gonna take more time and will require more patients from many of our, many of our health system leaders, uh, which brings me to my next point. We, tr we try to keep up with the pace of our group um, by making this process cyclical. So we've actually conceptualized this as kind of a multi-disciplinary uh, approach using both experts in continuous quality improvement and health services researchers. And so we, we tend to take some of these problems that come to us and work kind of rapid cycle, plan, do, check, act, um, PDCA cycles with those problems that uh, can be solved through those means but at the same time, we recognize there are other problems, often underlying problems, even to those ones that we are solving along the way that will require more methodological research. And we hope that over in time, as those studies are conducted and results are learned, we can then inject some of the knowledge that we, we gain from those, those studies into the improvement processes and, and inform our, our PDCA cycles um, that work more quickly uh, along the way. So a couple of examples of this, and again, these are pretty crude examples and I'm sharing really basic details, even though of course these were much more complicated uh, in practice. Um, but this is kind of an example of one of those more rapid cycle uh, PDCA type processes that uh, we, we went through recently. So there was a problem identified that uh, for patients at our main campus hospital who were undergoing routine total joint arthroplasty, their length of stay was longer than expected. And this was attributed to the fact that they were missing physical therapy visits on post-op day zero, which is what we would consider standard practice. So a learning community was formed around this particular problem, um, specifically therapists from our uh, orthopedics team, uh, nurses from the PACU and our orthopedic uh, nursing units. Um, and then of course the surgeons and advanced practice providers uh, who were engaged in this problem. So uh, using the terminology we learned from Dr. Friedman, uh, the performance to data piece of this was around the question, uh, why are patients not being evaluated by a physical therapist on post-op day zero? Recognizing that was kind of the, the primary issue. And so data were collected around that question, um, both from the electronic health record and also using um, stakeholder engagement and kind of more qualitatively collecting some of that information. I was understood from those data collection processes that um, there was a delayed consult to physical therapy following surgery and that there weren't enough staff late in the day to provide uh, evaluations for these patients, especially when they were coming out of the OR later in the day. So that led to new processes, um, new performance, uh, where PACU nurses in a more standardized way would release the physical therapy console and the electronic health record uh, to communicate that need and a shift in our PT staffing so that they were more availability later in the day. Now as kind of a more uh, wicked problem um, that we're currently addressing and in the midst of addressing or probably maybe in the second or third iteration of a cycle on this um, is that there's evidence to suggest that post-acute rehabilitation following stroke is, has fairly low value, meaning especially facility-based care is really costly and patients have really highly variable outcomes. And so um, we have now formed a hypothesis around this where um, we feel that we can discharge patients home with high intensity home-based rehabilitation like they would receive in a facility. 
um, but provide those at home where costs may be lower. And our hypothesis is that the function for these patients will be at least equivalent to what they would receive in, uh, or what they would achieve in a facility. So the learning community around this is um, really operational. Um, this, I, this problem was identified by our accountable care organization. And it wasn't specifically initially for patients with stroke, as I'll show in the example on the next slide. And it also includes our Center for Connected Care, and now our Neurological Institute and Cerebrovascular Center, our care managers, and of course, our therapists. So a, a couple of questions that we're tackling as part of this cycle are first, how many patients were eligible for this high-intensity home-based rehabilitation actually made it to this post-acute care setting or this approach for post-acute care? And then uh, second, does it actually Im uh, impact functional outcomes in the way we think? And so we identified again through some data collection processes that um, the clinical el eligibility were uh, inadequately defined in some of our pilot processes. Um, that was primarily through um, the ability to uh, collect qualitative data with stakeholders. And then lastly, um, we did see in those pilot data that there was uh, an, some equivalence in uh, discharge function for patients in this home-based program versus patients in a skilled nursing facility. So now we're adapting this for patients with stroke and identifying new opportunities um, to implement this in a way that we feel is efficient uh, with stakeholders on, on the front lines of this problem. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to present and I look forward to the continued discussion.